We're now at sutra number three, four. Before we start on anything new, do we have any questions left over from last week? Or Number three, four. When these three, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, are all directed toward their end, um, that is samyama, attunement with or absorption in. This samyama is a state of identification with whatever one perceives. I was interested in the fact that Swami used that word. So, you know, dharana is concentration. Um, uh, dhyana, dhyana is concentration. Dharana is, let's see, how do we say it? Interiorization of our attention. Concentration of our attention. And then becoming one with that. So, so samyama is to be identified with whatever one perceives. So, the... The entire state of delusion, in a very real sense, is that we are always identified with who we think we are. And so whatever we're perceiving, we are always the reference point. And this goes on when he starts talking about jivan mukta and how you become freed and how you you gradually dissolve the sense of ego. It's that identification with ourselves as the doer this constant remembrance of my own position in the cosmos, and that is what keeps us bound, and that's what causes karma. And so even if we're acting in this world as jivan muktas, as free souls, that identification with oneself and one's own actions is what has given way. And that what identif- one identifies samyama, which is a word I'd never heard before, so... I'm having to sort of get used to it because it doesn't, it doesn't have any inherent meaning in my mind like some of the other words do. That's just my limitation because I've never studied this before. But um, we're always, our ability to be absorbed in anything is always inhibited because so much of our energy has to, has to remain in our own uh, ego vortex. All those little vrittis in the chakras at the center of each one is the belief that something happened to me and that some part of me still remembers it and that it's still unfinished business. That's what creates all those vrittis. That's why if a master acts, no karma is created because he is completely identified with the universal reality, not with the limited reality. As master put it, he doesn't, sometimes he couldn't remember which body he has to keep going. That's such a, a fascinating thing to contemplate. I mean, if you are, even in this room, just with each other, as good friends as we are, as we've known each other, many of us, a very long time, still, we're, we are so far from actually being able to completely identify with any reality in this room except our own. Master said to one of his disciples, you have a sour taste in your mouth. And the disciple was startled how could master know that he said well I'm as much in your body as I am in my own that he could actually feel it that closely I mean we do develop on the spiritual path a certain amount of intuition we can tell how other people are feeling sometimes and often we get each other's thoughts and there's a a sense of unified energy but never to the point where we actually really become anyone but ourselves because we're too deeply identified with it I reached, when, the, when I was part of the monastery at Ananda Village all those years ago, a group of ten women, the core of it was about ten, and we used to, for, for many years, we used to get up every morning, we'd meditate half an hour together early in our little teepee temple there, and then we'd go back to our own places and, and meditate longer. That's how we did it. So we had group, group meditation every day, but we had it short, and then we finished our meditation elsewhere. Um, but I used to wonder, and it was, it was sort of a joke, but not really, because we did that for so long and so consistently, and, we, and our lives were so integrated. I used to wonder why, when we went into the temple, we always came out the same one. <laughs> like, why didn't we just switch around and sometimes come out somebody else? Why did we always come out the same one? Of course, because we were individually so identified with the one that we were living, that there was no way that we could let it go. 
compared to a master. So, so Swami's use of that word, this samyama is a state, samyama is a state of identification with whatever one perceives because one has broken any other sense of identification and one is capable of just entering into it. I mean, one, even if one can't go into that, that complete superconscious state, you can imagine what that would feel like and you can um, help expand our consciousness toward that by paying attention to the habitualness of identification with self how we're always thinking like that and the freedom that would come if we didn't. What if we were just moving through this and there was no... I often try to think about this. What if there was no particular protective involvement with this particular one, but one was truly impersonally able to see the welfare of all as identical as my own welfare? I mean, that's actually the state of a master. Remember the story about whoever the holy man was that they were hanging up by his thumbs and he started chanting and everybody became so inspired that they were all chanting with him and meanwhile he's hanging there by his thumbs but everybody just they were all lost in the in the bliss of it and he was happy for their bliss he wasn't thinking about his own body certainly that was the state of Jesus Christ when he was crucified his only concern was for the well-being of all those for whom he was responsible there was simply no self for him to be concerned about. It was a body, it was happening, it was happening to an individual um, jiva, but there was nothing more um, I about that jiva than any of the others. Imagine the freedom of that, the absence of pain, the complete dissolution of fear, um, the impossibility of loneliness, And that's how these states are truly accomplished by the kind of radical um, samyama that's being described here. Yes. So in the sutra right before, Swami had just said, I will say simply that samadhi means the state of oneness with God. So we had that sutra and it kind of feels like we did everything we could do. Samadhi is oneness with God. We're kind of there, right? Right. And now in this sutra, it's saying samadhi plus the two stages before it can be directed towards an end. Then you are identified with it. Like how is, I don't understand where we're trying to go after we've already hit samadhi. And we spend a lot of time here. Yeah, I see, I see there's more coming, which yeah, is why I'm just, wondering, like how can you even direct samadhi towards an end? Well, he talks about... Uh, intuitive understanding comes that there's gradual stages to this even these three are external to the seedless samadhi he says later Um, I can't unravel this I myself actually had the same dilemma that you're having I thought wow I thought we'd hit the end because insofar as we ever really think about this we think of samadhi being the last point And that's why I'd never even heard the word samyama. Maybe I'm just displaying my total ignorance here, but I never really had seen it, except on the, there's some yoga studio that calls itself that. And I've actually passed that yoga studio here, you know, true confessions, and I've been meaning to look up the word for a really long time. And then all of a sudden I find it here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, now we know. Sort of. of. (laughs) So I think it's a very interesting question, sort of what I have here later, when he says samyama is to be practiced in stages, I realize what we're working with. We're working with advice for very advanced yogis here. And that's one of the reasons why we're moving faster through this part of the book. (laughs) Yes. um, Uh So I noticed back in that previous sutra again, Uh Swami put those bits in parentheses. So the original... I assume the parentheses are Swami's clarifications, right? The original says the subject and the object of meditation become one. Right. And Swami clarified it, meaning the meditator and God. Yes. But the sutra itself was sort of general, so theoretically you could... No, actually, have... see, Swami, Swami precisely and strongly objects to the fact that many translators have tried to make this not about God. And Swami says, no, this has to be about God. That's what we're talking about here. 
God makes it, you wonder how you can get anywhere else to go into yeah, the well, next Well, I do. Seat. I know. I completely, uh, there I am with you. And so then all of a sudden, when these three, Dharana, Dhyana, Dhyana, and Samadhi, are all directed toward their end, when they're all doing what they're supposed to do, then we become completely absorbed in whatever we are perceiving. So, now, now but see, think I mean, about it. Maybe can you, can you have Samadhi being one with God without being identified with? No, but what I think we're talking about is that then we can direct. See, when all of three of these are in place, I believe we can direct this energy in any direction we wish to direct it. And I think that's what we're, what's happening here. Okay? Because it then comes intuitive understanding. Because, see, samadhi, this is where it is. Um, that even when you get to samadhi, and this is where he talks about it here. Let's see, let me just find this. Actually, it sort of seems as though... So you've achieved the state of oneness with God, but then it says it's a state of identification with whatever one perceives. So it's actually kind of bringing it back down. If you are one with God, well, then you're one with me and with him and with the chair. But let me just, I'm, I'm just trying to find the page because he starts talking about uh, uh, the Jivan Mukta and how you go on from being a Jivan Mukta. There it is. It's number 3.8, see? Because then he starts talking about moksha, or final liberation beyond... Um, Jivan Mukta, then there's Nirbhakalpa versus Sabhakalpa Samadhi, and you have to go back and you have to dissolve the, uh, the, the memory of your individuality in all of these different places. And um, by Samyama on latent impressions, one comes to know his past lives. I sort of feel like this is the project that begins once you've reached Samadhi, is that you have to become completely free. Because you can be in the state of, here it is, you can be in the state of samadhi and still not be completely free because you can be a jivan mukta and have samadhi. So samyama is how you actually become a siddha after you reach the state of samadhi. I'm making that up, but I think that's what, I think that's what it says here. Yes? Yeah, because uh, according to some of the things we've heard about Swami, he actually had samadhi at one time and then came back. He came so, back, right. Yeah. So there is a chance to be in samadhi and then it's only a period of time, and then you're back to being... Yes, exactly. Well, it's a state of samadhi is something that you go into. and well, That's nirbhakalpa, sabhakalpa samadhi, the two kinds of samadhi. One is you're completely finished, and one you still, it's still conditional. So the samyama comes in once that state is achieved to finish the job. That's, that's, what, I've, that's what I actually got from this. It's there to finish the job. This is advice for very advanced yogis because that's what this book is for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because someday it'll be relevant. We'll remember. <laughs> we'll know where to look. <laughs> when we have a, okay, pardon me. Yeah, that's it. That's what happened when I said to Swamiji about parts of the Gita commentary. So when he was he actually was he was going through exactly the same, exactly the same thing. Once you're in samadhi, once you have become jivan mukta, how do you then dissolve the remaining karma? How do you finish? How do you erase the memories and all of that? And he was being very specific again. I said, sir, this won't apply to very many. Yes, he said, but for those for whom it is relevant, it will be very helpful. That was his comment, just like that. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. Um, Prashad? It's on all the time now. This is, this is just sort of like a guessing game, but can we infer that Swami actually processed all this stuff or he just sort of received it and wrote it down? Did he, was he speaking from experience? I believe so. I don't think he could have written with his power if he didn't know what he was talking about. Same with the Gita. Yeah, I think it was his experience that he was offering us. But it's an opinion. But I, I don't, I'm quite convinced of it. Because he never wrote about anything he didn't fully know. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? So, when these three... <laughs> so, so now we've talked about, you know, I'm actually trying to take, and you'll see me do this all the way through, I try to draw some more relevant, some relevant level of meaning from each of these because I 
can't talk about once we have samadhi how we're going to use these. When we get there, you'll find a different coach. Okay. <laughs> or if I'm there with you, then we'll all work it out together and that'll be just great. You know, speaking of that, this is just an interesting thought. I was reading in conversations with Yogananda um, that story that um, you've probably heard Swami tell before, read in that book about when, when a Raja was excavating a lake and he found three meditating yogis buried under the ground there. And then they told the story about how the Raja put red hot pokers to their feet and pulled them out of that state. And they were very, and now see here, they were very um, upset because they were almost free and now they had been pulled back. But obviously they were in a pretty high state of samadhi to be able to be buried under the ground, I believe under a lake, for who knows how long. But once they were brought out of that state, they couldn't go back into those bodies. Um, so this is, this is an answer. This is the beginning. Um, but the thought that was interesting to me is that there were three of them and they were doing it together. That was a thought that hadn't crossed my mind until, I mean, I've heard that story many times, but I thought... They were three friends, obviously, soul companions who had set out on this quest together and were, you know, in this deep state together. Isn't that an interesting thought when you... Because we, we tend to go solitary with these ideas. But all of a sudden, there you, there you have that. And they were moving, um, you know, in the same flow. Were they helping each other? Were they communicating with each other? I mean, talk about group meditation... Pardon me? Group meditation, that's exactly what I was about to say. Talk about group meditation, the ultimate group meditation. But also, um, as above, so below. <laughs> I mean, if, if at that stage they had come together to do their sadhana together like that, I mean, it doesn't it suddenly have all kinds of interesting just uh, ramifications, implications about how things could work or why or you know. it would be simpler if there were two because then you would think maybe they were soulmates but the fact that there were three and you could just sort of see boon companions for many lifetimes finding themselves together or a guru and disciples i mean a guru in you know one who was helping two others who who knows fascinating so Having said that, that was also related to samyama after samadhi. So, pardon me? So, we're going to... <laughs> we'll all just sit down at the... No, you don't start under. You just start somewhere. <laughs> and then, then you're so deep that the world changes around you and you don't notice. That's how it works. And we could start under, but I, I think we would leave our bodies in a different way. Well, they'll fall down on top of us. But that would happen. Master, I was reading Mejda recently, and Master talked about his affection for, you know, isolated meditation places, and he talked about a temple, I, maybe it was in Calcutta, I'm not certain, where he found a tiny little, sort of just a tiny little opening that his skinny body could go through, and then he went down three flights of stairs and found some room and he would just sit under there and meditate for long periods of time. Yeah, he have yeah. yeah, there's not enough oxygen for a flame, but there was enough oxygen for him. But still the, um, the mindset of that and the life of Ramana Maharshi is like that too. Because he, Ramana Maharshi, when he was in his late teens, I believe, he just had this revelation that, that everything was just a dream and there was no point in it. And he just walked away. He just walked away from his life. And he, he went to this temple and he found an underground room and he sat and started meditating. And he just disregarded everything. It's a fantastic story. And it's also, I wrote about that when I was in India last year, just how... Well, the part of it, uh, now that I'm remembering the whole of it, was what was interesting to me was for him that was the natural thing to do. 
he just walked away at that point. And I remember the whole story because I'd had a satsang in wherever we were, whatever city, and somebody had expressed just the most, most amazement that when I was 23, after I met Swami when I was 22, I just, of course, I just left everything and went to live at the Ananda community, which was basically nothing. The community was nothing at that point. And they sort of were, you know, what did your parents say? What did you think? I just sort of looked at them when, in the satsang and thought, well, of course I was going to do that. What else would I do? And I suddenly saw in that context that my doing that, I mean, it wasn't on the level of by any means. I mean, don't even begin. Of Ramana Maharshi just walking away from his house and going to the basement of the temple. But for me, it was just the most natural thing to do. Whereas for the person who was inquiring about it, they just, it, it, was, it was wildly improbable that they could have left their family, their prospects of marriage, their careers, their education, this, this, this. But for me, it was just the right thing to have done. And I suddenly saw, oh, that's exactly how Ramana Maharshi felt. It was just the natural thing for him to do. So he just did it. He wasn't thinking, oh, this is so daring. Look how radical I am. It was just, his vibration. So he just walked off to do that. That's an important thing to realize. That's a, that's a bit how Master responded to Swamiji. When Swamiji said, uh, I'd rather be like Jesus than merely have a beard and resemble him slightly, the Master said, oh, that will come. Just so casually. Because, in fact, it would become his vibration. The, the rest of the context of that was the, this uh, Baba, that we, this uh, yogi that we met up in... Uh, Bajranat, who who is reputed, and I have no reason to think it's not true, in when the winter snows come, he's he's one of the one of the only yogis who doesn't leave when the snows come because all their their kutirs are buried under ten or twelve feet of snow, but he puts his body in this metal box, and he closes the box, and then he leaves his physical body there, and he says he goes off to be with Babaji in the Himalayas. And he's called Bakswala Baba for that reason. <laughs> Bakswala because of the box. Um, and when Swami asked me what I thought of him, I, I told him I just didn't know where to begin. The impression, the experience of meeting him was very moving because we, we had climbed up above the ten or 11,000 feet where the Bhadrinath Temple is, up the mountain to his little kutir. And I was sitting in this little kutir, which is, oh, smaller half the size of this dais, looking out at the Himalayas, and it was, everything about it was so evocative, I couldn't separate his presence from everything else I was doing. But then I said to Swamiji, but he was so casual about going into the box for the winter and then going off to be with Babaji. And then Swami just looked at me and said, well, at a certain point, it's natural. Same thought. Oh, I, I mean, in all of it, it seems so far away until I saw what was so natural to me looked amazing to this other woman. And I thought, oh, it's just, you just move in your own vibration. And when you're moving in your own vibration, it's, it's good not to think of it as anything but natural either. It's just, well, this is what I would do. Given who I am, this is what I'll do. And so, <clears throat> even though we're joking a little <clears throat> about samadhi and what comes after, that will come. And we'll look it up. And... The weird thing is, we each of us still be us, which kind of can freak me out sometimes, so I don't think about it. <clears throat> but I suppose by then we're not identified with us anymore, so it doesn't matter, right? I mean, doesn't anyone else ever feel that? That's my streak of madness. When I, when you, I mean, that's the streak of existential madness. When you get that there's no escape from your own consciousness except to transform your consciousness. That's when the memory of my lifetimes of, of being out of my mind, you know, in certifiably out of my mind, it rises. Because during those lifetimes, I'm, I'm not actually being facetious, but these are not actual, these are, these are not actual memories, but this is sure knowledge on my part, that I did that. I just saw the uh, challenge of transforming consciousness and there being no other escape. And so I did what Swamiji says the soul does. He says every soul goes through madness. 
because it's just too much. You just to realize that you, you're just never going to escape. So you escape. You go into a completely subconscious world for a while until that one wears out and you find out it didn't work. And whatever that is for me, it's, it's a little closer to the surface than some things might be. I see people drinking liquor and that doesn't appeal to me, but to solve the problem by going crazy um, resonates. <laughs> Odd, isn't it? But, you know, even here it says, even later... Um, you can you can by concentrating on you know your all these things, but by samyama on latent impressions in the mind, one comes to know his past lives. And that's just I mean that little exercise I just described is just in my own small way. That's exactly what it is. So she uh, needs a. I don't know if, if what you were describing about going into madness um, is the same the thing that happens to me, but sometimes um, when I realize that I do have to change my consciousness, it is, it's just so overwhelming. I need to go for a walk. It, you, you try to escape the, the blunt. You try to escape the inescapable. You're just facing into it and you need to distract your mind because it's too much pressure on your mind. And, and, then, and then while I'm walking, then I can kind of um, get myself... I mean, because there's so much to lose if I keep walking <laughs> yeah. and never come back. Oh, and yeah. So, oh, yeah. Exactly. No, you're, you're, you're right on it. Yeah. There's so much to lose if you keep walking and never come back. But the worst of it is you will never get away from it. Once... You know the possibility of divine realization. You will never be content uh, with anything else. I mean, all these things, th- this is why the uh, uh, spiritual path is not for sissies. And that's why when we're doing the disciples course that we did, uh, the spiritual warrior classes that we did, the first quality of the devotee is courage. And I mean, I, I really get that. It's, it's, it takes a lot of courage to just accept that this is, you know, we're going to do this now. That's why, that's why it's so foolish to, to judge yourself or others for occasionally falling off the straight and narrow. My word, I mean, what we've ab- absorbed. So you're tempted by a beautiful woman or a handsome man and, you know, you fall into sexuality for a day or a year or you drink occasionally, or you just go off, go bonkers for a while. I mean, it's just, we need to be very sympathetic with ourselves and with others because it's a very serious proposition. And if every so often we panic, um, that's okay. Just eventually come back, you know. It's like not being equipped to handle, well, like was Master saying, somebody asked if he could have samadhi, and Master said, could you... Could you handle it? And I guess, I guess if I was really ready, then it would just happen. But I'm not. But I. Have well, no, it's, it's fine not to be. Oh, that's but that's it's part so of what's awful. necessary. Is it? No. <laughs> no, actually, I, it, it isn't. We are ex- we are doing exactly what our vibration is capable of doing, and to uh, just to even to imagine that you could do more. It's, it's just it, it's 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 an absolutely pointless exercise. Just what I was saying before: you will do what your vibration allows you to do, and to always be thinking that you can force yourself to be something that you're not is just an utter waste of time. You need to do what you can do, with 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 a natural commitment, and then you need to keep you keep you need to keep. Having the positive experience of the spiritual path because that's what gradually refines your vibration. If the spiritual path for you just becomes another form of self-torture, I mean, this was like 50 years ago, almost now, 45, 40 years ago. Yoga Journal, back in the beginning of all of this, they wrote this article, I loved it. I mean, I loved it for its craziness. The Dark Side of Meditation it was called. And it said type A personalities often take up meditation because uh, they do it to relieve stress and so on. And then they become neurotic about being perfect as meditators. 
and that meditation itself becomes uh, an, a, another unattainable perfection. And that's true. I mean, I've ha- I have friends, uh, not, not within Ananda, but in other places, who have actually, the spiritual path is actually, the way they approached it, it, it never worked because they used it as a reason to always be inadequate. And of course, you're trying to be perfect. So it's really easy. So, you, so it's extremely important just to relax. Really important just to relax. And then have fun. And the more fun you have, the more you just keep doing it. I mean, I've watched recently in the last few years in myself, I, I sort of have watched my habits and I've, I've observed that my habits have refined recently. Some of them, not all of them, by no means. But some of them have just refined and I never made any decisions. It's just suddenly I was, more, I was able to do things that I just wasn't able to do before. And, and it, it, it's not like I wasn't trying, but I wasn't forcing. And then every so often you pretend you're going to run away. David and I driving down, you know, to Sunday service every morning. You know, every, not, we don't always, but, you know, every so often we see people carrying their newspapers into Starbucks. And we think, yeah, that's a life. On Sunday mornings you buy a newspaper and go sit in Starbucks instead of going off to church. But, you know, it's not really like we would want to, but part of you thinks of it sometimes. Master, in the Awake movie, after Dhirananda betrayed him and he had all that horrible cycle of time, he went to Mexico and didn't know if he was coming back. He, I mean, it wasn't about consciousness then, but he just had it. I was reading, uh, uh, the, I've been reading the history of Ananda because of this book I'm working on. And there was a point where Swami went to Hawaii and he said he wasn't sure he was coming back. You know, he did, and Master did. But there's just a a point where you have to say to your mind, I think I may have done all I can do. And I need to just think in a different way. Not... Pardon me? Pardon me? He said, uh, Swamiji, um, you know, was talking about perhaps not coming back. I said he did come back. He wasn't leaving the spiritual path. But even Master and even Swamiji at a certain point just thought, you know, maybe I've pushed myself as far as I can go and that maybe something else is trying to happen. I mean, for them to think that way is different because they weren't trying to escape. They were just wondering if it was finished. I think for us as devotees, it's more dangerous to entertain possibilities because we're more likely to be diluted, diluted and diluted both, you know. So it's good to just stick with what you're sticking with. Okay? Yeah. But the thought of going, getting in the car and never coming back. I thought of getting in the car and never coming back quite often. But the problem is I would be in the car. <laughs> if I could figure out that part. <laughs> and then that's the part when I have to sometimes just... Really breathe deeply. <laughs> mm-hmm. when, I'm, when I'm looking at the computer sometimes, I'm staring into the screen and I'm trying to find something and I don't even know what it is. Then I don't know what to answer you. <laughs> is that a question? Yeah, I mean, is, do you know, do, can you make any sense of that? No? Okay. Sorry, I can't. Well, we're all looking in a very real sense for something we don't know what it is because we don't know what it feels like to be perfectly free. There's no place I can click on the computer that will get me where I want to go. I mean, Ananda sites are helpful. (laughs) Well, actually, I mean, I have no idea, Marilyn, if I'm relating to what you're saying or not. But, I I mean, I saw this baby on, on one of my long trips and, you know, parents who travel with small children across time zones and, you know, the children just gradually lose their marbles. It's just, it's a special kind of either heroism or idiocy or dedication to the grandparents that caused people to take these little children on these long journeys. So we were somewhere in some airport and there was this little baby. He was maybe two. He was just, a, a, just pre-verbal. He didn't quite have words together. And God knows what day or night he thought it was. And he was in his little stroller 
and he was just, he wasn't, he didn't even have the energy to make a lot of noise, but he made a continuous noise that was kind of like, and then he would flail back and forth. And I, he was just saying, I looked right at him, I could see it. I am miserable, the baby was saying, somebody do something. <laughs> and his poor parents, I mean, there was nothing that could be done. I, that's, I feel that way sometimes. You're just walking around your life and I'm miserable, somebody do something. I don't mean miserable, you know, like agony, just like I want it to be better than this. I want more freedom, I want more joy. And one does. One opens books, one, one turns on the computer, you know, one sits on one's meditation cushion and if one is feeling too bad, one just gets up again. You know, one goes outside, one goes inside. It's just like that little baby. I feel miserable, somebody do something. And the only solution is change of consciousness. And if that um, mood has grabbed you, it's, it's not always so easy to change consciousness. So one, that's where the eight manifestations of God become very helpful. Because you, if you're not in joy or in love or in peace, you, generally speaking, I find, if you put out energy. So literally going for the walk or getting on the bicycle is really the right thing to do. Even retail therapy can help you at that point. If you're not just uh, trying to, if you're, if you're really literally trying to calm your consciousness, not just distract it. If you're not running away from the problem, you're just trying to get more centered in the problem. You know, there's no illusion that I'll just go get drunk and I'll feel better. There's just the thought that I've, just got, I've got to change the magnetism in the moment and get myself back into center. And then I'll be okay again. Yeah, I mean, I think we all, we all waffle there. Somebody wrote to me about the phrase he used was spiritual anguish. And I wrote back, I said, I think Swamiji experienced that a great deal of the time. Just almost an unbearable impatience with this world. We just do. That's why. This is not a very cheerful talk. But that, that's why um, courage is so important. There's no way around this. I mean, this is why <laughs> we're such a small group. <laughs> I don't just mean here tonight. I mean the self-realization is on the planet. Because we're just not we're not promising anything. We're, we're, we're just band together to do the real work. Trying to help each other do the real work and there's no other way around it. We've, we've reached the end of the uh, temporary fixes. And, and uh, each devotee, you really have to get that. Swamiji, when he had a list of three, re- three things you have to do, um, Absolute honesty was one. I can't remember what the second one was. It slips my mind. But the third one was, you have to realize that the spiritual path, this is keys to success, is a matter of life and death. It's just, it's not like this is optional. I mean, this is the question of how do you really succeed, not how do you pass a pleasant lifetime living in an ashram, which is fine if that's that's better than not. But if we're really serious, we just have to know there's no options here. There's none. I mean, I'm, I feel fortunate in, it's never, even though I, I've played out this scenario in my mind, I've, I've never thought of doing anything else. I've never doubted it. It just hasn't, I, I obviously have done that enough, been there, done that one, and not, I'm just not going to do it again. I, I can panic in the midst of this one, but it, part of the panic is that I know there's no choice. If I thought there was a choice, I wouldn't panic. You know, if you think you can get out of it, why would you worry? <laughs> well, something that seems to help me is the fact that, because, like, physically it's challenging for me to sit to even meditate and so forth, is that I know I'm never going to give up. I'm very yeah. persistent. Yeah. And that helps. Oh, heavens, yes. I mean, it really does. That's why I'm saying you don't even have to worry about You don't have to push yourself to be more than you are. What you have to build into yourself is the fact that I will persevere. 
Persevering is more important than wild, dramatic gestures. Because wild, dramatic gestures often just result in too much tension, and you can't hold it. Better to just know I'm not going to quit, so even if I <clears throat> dip down a little, it's not a problem because I'm not going to quit. Just as simple as that. Oh, it's, it's everything. It's everything on the spiritual path to know that you're not going to quit or to be determined not to quit or better still to know you're not going to quit because you can't. That's when Jesus' disciples were being driven away by him at the end of his life and he said to Peter, um, will you also leave me? I mean, Jesus had to ask that question. I mean, nobody's a done deal. Now the Bible makes Peter so perfect or, you know, tells the story, but Peter, there he was. He was, he was on his way. He was working on it. Jesus said, will you also leave me? And Peter says, where, where could I go? That's, I mean, that answer, it says everything about the path. It's like he, he crossed that line where he knew that Jesus was a master, Jesus was his master, that everywhere he possibly went in all of creation, he would have to, he would still have to be Jesus' disciple. There's, there was no alternative to it. And there's a certain relaxation in that. Once you get over the panicky bit, which is really not what I feel most of the time, but there, that, that's, a, that's a, 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 what you would call it, a, fr- a fragrance, or probably a stink is actually the right word, but you know, just this sort of thing that wafts past my brain every once in a while. But I can push it aside. Does that make sense? Well, on that cheerful note, let's take a break. Okay. <laughs> let's go back to the simplicity of Samyama. <laughs> this class, this is actually that, that thing where you say, this is the last class of this year, because it is. Uh, we decided next week was canceled for some other reason, and so we decided not to do any more classes in December. So Samyama is going to have to wait until whatever the January first date is. I don't know how the Tuesdays come, but whatever it is. The first, the first reasonable Tuesday in January is when we'll start. Unless it's the 5th. It's not the 5th. It's the 6th. Okay, the 6th then. Okay, so any other uh, uh, comments before we go galloping through Samyama here? That was, all got kind of interesting, didn't it? Okay, so number three, five. By the mastery of samyama comes intuitive understanding. Intuition doesn't mean imagination. It means understanding from within, understanding the inner nature of things. This is samyama. So if we go back up here that we identify with whatever we're perceiving, that means if you identify with something, you can really, you feel it, as, as clearly as you feel any other reality, and therefore you would have intuitive, not reason, not deduced. He looks a little tense today. I wonder what's bothering him. But just the experience of whatever it is that he or she or it is feeling in the world. Swami used to talk about when he would photograph flowers, he always was felt that he was in relationship with flowers, and he he would take particularly beautiful pictures of flowers and he always felt the flowers knew how much he, he liked them and that they were giving back to him uh, the affection that he was giving to them. And it's a very, it's a very real and important point. Durga, um, when she used to take a lot of pictures, she, she, you know, people with expensive cameras and expensive lighting and so on would try to take portraits but the best portraits would be the ones where Durga would say, smile, like that, because she is such a, a, a great lover of people. And she, she just has such a welcoming vibration that you turn and you see Durga and you, you give her your heart back. I mean, it was kind of a joke that her pictures were always so good of people because that's how she related to them. She, I mean, and now... Perhaps it wasn't samyama in the full Sanskrit definition of the word, but she identified with them. She paid attention. She, she concentrated. Swami, when he was with a rose, he experienced the rose's reality. Rather than being a photographer taking a picture of a rose, he was in the rose, he was with the rose, and he was feeling what it, 
was like. I had a wonderful experience with a rose in our community. Um, one, uh, it was about this time of year. It, I, I don't remember exactly the details, but it was, it was turning cold, but it hasn't, hadn't gotten really cold. It was in those years when we were not in a drought, so there was more, we were having more seasons. And I was, it was right in the archway that's right by the swimming pool, just past the manager's apartment, manager's office in our place. And I was walking one cold day. There were no other roses blooming. And this one bush had sent a, 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 a branch, you know, a few feet higher than anything else. And at the top of it was one magnificent red rose. And I, I really spent a long time with that rose. I could feel it wasn't arrogance on his part. <laughs> he had just wanted to wait until we just really needed one more rose. <laughs> That's how I felt. <laughs> and he just sort of hung back so that when we all thought roses were over, he could just give us one more. It, and it was, maybe it was my imagination. I don't know. Intuition is not imagination. If it, if it was, it was a pleasant fancy. But there was just so much about him. He was just really doing something marvelous, something extra. Here's the microphone if you wanted to speak. I think this notion of identifying <clears throat> with whatever you're contemplating is uh, probably really, really close to uh, realizing that center is everywhere and circumference nowhere mm -hmm. in a really, really big way. Yeah. Because uh, when you're in a, in a position to have this Samyan experience, um, you're probably pretty coming from your center big time yourself yeah. and, you, and you, you're really beginning to realize in a very real direct way that, uh, you know, when you come right down to it, uh, so is everything else. And it's, it's the same center. Yes. And uh, it's just something to do with that, I'll bet. I think that's the truth. I think that's definitely the truth because you're not identified with the center you're in. You can shift your center to whatever you're perceiving, I think. Same one. Yeah, the, the same, same one. Exactly. Um, also, I mean, this, the simple point that Swami bothers to speak, intuition doesn't mean imagination. That's something we always have to keep in mind. Even though we're always trying to be intuitive, we always have to be a little careful, just like I was saying about the rose. I think that was the experience that I had, but I'm more than willing to concede I was just projecting upon that rose all of these attitudes, that it was just my imagination that the rose had the personality I was giving him. Um, it's, we always have to be just a little bit careful and, until we're completely free. Because intuition and imagination can get a little confused. Directional too. You might have been tuning into the center of the rose yeah. a lot more than uh, I would or most people would just on a, on a normal flyby. But there's also because uh, uh, missing the point and false notions way earlier in this book, you may remember, are something that he warns us about. And I feel like Swami's bringing that back to us here. He says, it means understanding from within. Um, part of, uh, we were having a conversation in a different class over the weekend on Saturday. And somebody asked me about forgiveness. Our class was about feelings and relationships. Some of you were there. And someone asked about forgiveness. And I, I appreciate that forgiveness is a beautiful concept. And Swamiji would talk about it. People have written about it. But it's never been my favorite concept because I... I don't like I don't like the position of being the, the magnanimous one who forgives. That's always felt slightly dangerous to me. And what I was saying um, is, is that really what we're looking for is to accept what is. Because we really understand. We just know that this is someone's inner nature. And I was remembering after the class was over this example of someone who was talking to me and it was a woman and some man had not behaved properly in her life and not only had he not behaved properly but when she confronted about it, him about it he didn't tell her the truth and then when finally the truth came out he gave excuses and repeatedly she kept saying to me why didn't he just tell me the truth why didn't he just tell me the truth and we'd sort of go around for a while. Then she would say again, why didn't he just tell me the truth? I said, because that's who he is. <laughs> He's a man who doesn't tell the truth. 
And that's what you have learned from this experience. And it's like, it's not a question of forgiving him for not telling the truth. It's recognizing that when this man gets under pressure, he lies to protect himself. And maybe he has other redeeming qualities and you feel like you can work with that. I mean, I mean that seriously. But you can't just keep railing at him and want him to be different and then generously forgive him because he's not. You haven't really progressed. When you really progress is when you understand it from within. You know, and, and, and these things are not so simple. You know, when people are young or inexperienced, they just imagine that you just, everybody's going to be perfect. No, people are not going to be perfect. People are going to be a strange combination of positive and not positive. And your job, our job, is to understand and to accept what is. Then there's no question of forgiving. It's just what is. And if we choose to be in relationship, you know, we choose to have associations, it helps to know who you have an association with. There was a, a woman who played a, just a, a, a terrible role in the persecution of Swamiji, someone that he'd befriended completely, and in the end she was just as, as treacherous as she could possibly be. But Swamiji still, as far as he was concerned, you know, he, was, he still felt a willingness to help her. So I said, Swamiji, if she wanted to come back and live at Ananda again, would you accept her? He said, well, if she sincerely repented, as he put it, or whatever word he used, repudiated her ways and really wanted to be serious on the spiritual path, of course I would, I would take her back, he said. But I would always know now the, of what she's capable and I would treat her differently because of that. It's just so simple. It's not like I forgive her. It's like, well, now I know that when the pressure comes, she'll be treacherous. So I have, to, I have to keep that in, I have to take that into account now when I relate to this person. See how much more dynamic that is? And this is all comes from what he's saying here. Intuition is understanding the inner nature of things. And of course, one of the best un- understandings we can have is the inner nature of each other. Yes. You know, it seems that so much of this is about the way we respond to stress or difficulties. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know, that people are sinners per se, though I suppose some are. But, you know, just this, it's, it's where do you break? Do where you, do you break? habitually um, blame the other person when things get difficult? Do you habitually betray somebody? Do you turn to some diversion that can then hurt somebody else? Yes, that's actually just which way do you break? And remember the story and uh, the path about Master having Norman and Swamiji take the two by fours to level the piles of sand, just one after another after another, uh, just to see which way they would break. And Swamiji finally started laughing. And then Master said something like, I was just playing with you you know, like some game. But he really was. Which way will you break when you're really, really pushed? Will you become self-protective? Will you become dishonest? Will you become self-justifying? Will you become angry? Will you become depressed? And, you know, we're... Life often pushes us to the breaking point and the Guru will do it deliberately just to, so that we ourselves can find out of what we are made. I mean, many tough things happen and that's the point. That's why, just so that we can find out what we're made of and we can learn on a higher and higher level to break toward the divine. What will I do when I have no more resources? Which way will I go? And that's some of the really inspiring and horrific stories you hear of prisoners of war and concentration camps and those incredible things are people absolutely pushed way far beyond anything they thought they could go and then finally surrendering to God at that point. That self-honesty is so, so absolutely essential. And then the, just the simple willingness to acknowledge what seems to be the case. Right. That this is what I did. And I'm not proud of it, but there's no reason to be ashamed either. (laughs) That's that's my little motto for these things. Because I don't have to be ashamed just because I'm not self-realized. But I don't have to be proud of myself when I make it really abundantly clear either. (laughs) But yes, 
to be honest enough to, to not, I mean, that's why in so many of Swami's, the thread through so much, you know, beware of rationalization, self-justification, you don't understand. I remember at a certain point, uh, during the time that Ananda was being persecuted, I've been reading the history of Ananda a lot lately, so this is in my mind. There was, there was just a lot of tension for a while. And there, there were people who were trying to, this sort of thing came up that you're, you're not listening. And I finally had to say, no, I'm listening very carefully. I disagree. That's quite different, do you understand? <laughs> because it, you're, you're saying that you're, if you were really listening, you'd agree with me. No, no, I've heard you perfectly clearly. I have rejected your point of view. So let's just call a spade a spade here. <laughs> Seems more often than not about being agreed with. Yes, it does. And you know, there's there's a tremendous amount that people try, because we're kind of all, because a lot of a lot of new ideas have all come at the same time, and a lot of psychological opening and various self development things have come at the same time as self realization has come. Sometimes people get confused, and I remember it during these periods of time too, when people were saying. And this was, people started saying this. People just say these things without thinking. One of them is confidentiality. You know, this absolute religion of confidentiality. And, uh, and it's not that we should be careless with other people's secrets. That would be foolish. But why would you want, not want people who can help you to know what's, what's happening to you? I mean, when Master told Swamiji, you know, you should tell me what's going on. Even when people don't want you to tell me what's going on, you should tell me what's going on. I said to Swamiji, you know, people sometimes tell me things and they tell me not to tell you. He said, tell me. <laughs> I said, of course, that's how I feel. It's like, why would they not want you to know? And so I would tell him because I knew that what they were asking was not in their own best interests. But there would, there would get to be this thing that we're not supposed to... But that's a, a modern idea. And it's not based on guru bhais. It's not based on discipleship. It's not based on spiritual community. Now, I'm not being casual about this, but I'm just saying these are not the values, the absolute values that people haven't... Well, it's, it's based on... Worldly situations is what it's really based on. It's based on environments where people can't be trusted with the information. But that's not here. And the other thing that came with that was Ananda, everyone at Ananda should feel safe. That was the phrase. And I listened to that for a while and finally I said, no, actually, everyone at Ananda should feel intensely threatened. <laughs> you should feel at all times like your ego is totally under siege. Because sometimes when people are saying that, what they mean is nothing should ever disturb my little concept of the world. No, no, absolutely not. That's not who we are. If you want that, you need to be somewhere else. Because that is not what we're doing. We are not here to protect each other and to make each other feel okay. We're here to help each other realize God. Now, that is not an excuse for brutality. But you, you all understand what I'm saying. It's just, it's important because otherwise we just spout these things without even really thinking about whether they apply. And we have to really stop and ask ourselves, now what are we doing here? That's why Swami's book, Sadhu Beware, such an amazing book when you read that. He said, if people misunderstand you, just let them misunderstand you. <laughs> if you get blamed for things you didn't do, don't defend yourself. You, you know, people don't have to understand you. Just let them misunderstand you. It's really quite fun when you really start just trying to really live that way. Oh, they all thought it was my fault and I could explain to them that it wasn't, but why should I? I just want, you know, I'm just protecting my ego to do that. Yes, Tandava. I was thinking about what you were saying about forgiveness and it feels like for the idea of forgiveness presupposes something happening to you, your ego, personally. Because, you know, I can't forgive 
you for something you did to him because it didn't involve me personally. It presupposes my ego was hurt or threatened. Right. And and that's part of why, because I, I resonate with what you said about it, it feels uncomfortable forgiving. And, and part of that, I think, is, well, because if I try and relate it to the other person, well, what really is the result of that? Um, I'm trying to think, you know, where to actually go with this, but maybe just the fact of, you know, forgiving yourself for having still an ego <laughs> that still gets hurt. And, you know, like, like you were saying, you know, this is exactly where we've gotten to at this point, and this is where we are, so that's just how it is. So you forgive yourself for having had that, and maybe you won't the next time. Um, the, the, what I think is important with the forgiveness discussion is that we are trying to, to, to achieve what people are trying to achieve with the word forgiveness. It's, it's what we're trying to become free of this sense of victimization or the sense of anger or resentment. We're try we definitely need to get free of all of those. I simply prefer to phrase the whole thing in a different way, which is once you understand, well, I'm, it came out of this, understanding from the inside, then I just recognize that this is reality. And, and that seems to me a more expansive way to achieve the same result which is then I'm, not, I'm no longer angry or upset and I don't long, no longer resent you instead of, why didn't you tell me the truth? It's just like, well, of course you wouldn't tell me the truth. It's not in your nature to do so at that time. And there you have it. And I forgive myself for being such a chump to have gotten myself mixed up with such a loser. But here we are. <laughs> you know, it's, but you get to the same place. But I, I, I think it's a more, I think that you can go farther with it. It's, it has more, more levels that are useful to my way of thinking. So I've seen Swami use the word forgiveness, not often, but I've seen him use it. Um, Ananda Prem. Are you suggest, I'm back on the confidentiality. Are you suggesting that um, there is never a reason why we should be confidential in case we think someone is, is uh, going to take that information and, and use it. There's every reason in the world to respect confidentiality as much as you possibly can. And the only time you should ever not respect it is when, out of very careful consideration, you feel that a higher value is, a higher good is possible. I've been caught several times in the course of Ananda life. And everybody, and I have to say this just very directly, everybody in Ananda takes this one differently. I've been caught several times in ways that really caused me and a lot of other people a lot of grief because somebody did not tell me something I really needed to know. Because, well, they asked me not to tell anyone. But then I was just thrown to the wolves, essentially. And it would have just been so easy, and I feel appropriate, for someone to have said, look, you know, just this is what's actually going on here. Oh, okay, because we're a very intertwined family. And I think I could be trusted with that information. And so in certain circumstances, and just so people don't get really paranoid about this, in certain circumstances when I have seen that happening and someone thinks that nobody should know, I realize this person has to know because that's the only way to bring a positive result here. And so then we play it out, you know. Sometimes it can be a fine line, though. You don't quite know whether it's uh, something that would result in a positive, um, you know. Yep. Sometimes I think that, you know, if I were to say certain things, um, it would just add fuel to the fire rather than... Well, then don't. ...bring anything, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, don't. You only... That's why I said you, you respect it. People need to feel that you'll keep their confidence. I mean, you know, you have to be a deep well. If people come to you and confide in you things that are very precious to them, you know, it just has to go in and never come out again. So I'm by no means suggesting that we should be casual about this, but there are occasions, you know, when it's just the greater good will be served. And I felt that sometimes when I felt Swami Kriyananda just needed to know things. 
And he was always very grateful to have me tell him. And it's right in conversations with Yogananda, him telling people, you know, of course you should tell me. I need to know. And then there's this whole, fascinating, this is number 99, this whole discussion of Master talking about the difficult position he's in, you know, being omniscient but not actually knowing everything. <laughs> that is really almost exactly what's written there and how omniscience really works. I, it is bizarre. It's number 99. You should go look at it. Yeah, it's quite amazing. He, he really describes how, you know, a tough position he's in because, he, you know, he is one with God and God knows everything, but God doesn't always tell him <laughs> or something. I'm probably now making a hash of it, but it was a very frank discussion on Master's part about why you still have to tell him, even though you think he would know. <laughs> right. But in the context of our... But I've had people, you know, just assert confidentiality as the highest value. I said, no, I think helping people is the highest value. And, you know, if I know that to whomever I am sharing, with whomever I'm sharing this has the maturity to use it as I would use it, then I, I don't have any hesitation. But I don't do it, and I haven't done it. But as I said, because it, it hasn't been done to me at different times, to, to rather ongoing, roll, outrolling messes, I really, I really recognize that sometimes something else is more important. But yeah, if it's fuel to the fire and the people can't be trusted, or just, I mean, don't even think about it. Just it can't be done. But I mean, you know, somebody was talking to me just the other day. They were, they were telling me the, about the certain things that they thought ought to be different and that they weren't the only one who felt that way, that they talked to quite a few others who also felt that way. I said, who? Oh, they don't want me to tell you. I said, well, I just don't talk about they. I just won't do it. I'll talk to you about your feelings. And if they have feelings, then they can talk to me. But there's nobody in the room here but you and me, and I'm just not going to do it. This is crazy. You know, that, that's also what I'm talking about. Oh, no, they, they were afraid to talk to you. Well, tell them to screw up their courage and come and talk to me. <laughs> it's just like, we're not going there. <laughs> all right, anything else? That was all about attuning to what is, accepting what is. We're actually, well, we can do one more here. Let's try it. This is number three, six. Samyama is to be practiced in stages. Though the outer yamas and niyamas, I suddenly, that's when I realized that samyama is the yamas, the niyamas, and samyama. They're all related to each other in ways that I don't know, but they appear to be. They all seem to be, have the same last name. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Oh dear, forgive me. I'm afraid this is a moment I'm going to be struck by lightning. <laughs> Sometimes Seva and I, we used to walk through the woods and we'd get so irreverent we'd be afraid that lightning would strike us. Though the outer yamas and niyamas admit of clear and obvious stages, the subtler path of samyama, though less easily differentiated, must also be taken one subtle step at a time. That was the... Um, the sutra that really got, got me thinking about this, that samadhi is just the beginning, and how much this book is advice for advanced yogis, that when you're, you know, working it out on this level, there's just no way to make a, a printed commentary that's going to work. It's going to be, I don't think the concepts can be translated into words. And, but then I remember how Swami has said several times that the practice of Kriya really starts once you're in the Shashumna, have you ever heard him say that? Once the, the upward and downward flow of energy has united in the inner spine, that's when Kriya practice really starts. Wow, okay. These are the things that make you, make me, just relax. I mean, far from making me tense, maybe I'm just goofy. It just makes me relax. I realize in this, samyama has to be practiced in subtle stages. It's like, eh, you know, there's... We're, not, we're going to persevere to the end, and someday this will be relevant. And when it's relevant, it'll be natural to us. But in the meantime, it's, it's a shoe that doesn't fit. And we just go, do what we can do, and if we do it well, then eventually it will. 
I mean, it's, it's such an advantage to have been on the path for a while because you really do realize that if you just don't quit, it does work. And so you can sort of hear Master saying that will come. And some part of you actually just knows that it will and knows that it will come much sooner <clears throat> if you just are lighthearted about it. Because then, see, because it's bad enough to have delusion, but then to have a complex about having delusion <laughs> is like a whole nother level. Then you've created like a whole second problem. <clears throat> and that second problem is actually worse than the first one. Because the first one is just straightforward. This is my karmic condition and it will gradually solve itself. To have a complex about your karmic condition just sends you off on a, a chasing your tail in just a hopeless sort of circle of na ah of not accepting what is. Big time. It's, it's, it's the ego's way of um, being obsessed with itself. If I can't be the greatest, then I can at least uh, be the worst. And I can at least suffer all the time because I'm so terrible. Swamiji so used to say to me, feeling guilty um, and pitting and, and being... Feeling guilty and dissolving in tears of self-pity is not the same as changing yourself. <laughs> I used to just kind of blink. I just didn't get it. He said it to me for a decade. And finally, just one day, just this tiny bit of light glimmered. He said, you exhaust yourself with all of that and then there's no energy left to change yourself. And then one day I finally got, oh yeah, if you, just have, if you have something to work on, just work on it. I just thought that whole intermediary stage of despair was essential. And it just took me a while to realize that it wasn't. But he said it to me over and over again. He, he had such a way. I loved it. He would say it to you, because see, I have, unfortunately, I have a very sharp memory. So he would just say it to you, and you would not have any idea what he was talking about and wouldn't know what to do with it. And then he would bring it up again, you know, a few years, a decade later, and he would just bring it up again as if it had just occurred to him. <laughs> he would just say it again to you as if this was a fresh idea, you know. <laughs> and then we'd just try it one more time, see if this time it was going to work. And uh, eventually it does. <laughs> and so God will keep doing that with us over and over. I got rather lighthearted about it after a while. <laughs> okay, great souls. I think that's it for tonight. Oh, that's it for 2014. So we'll wait till next year. We have done now. We did, um, we started at 3.4 and we got all the way to 3.6. Okay, so we start next year at 3.7.